I will go ahead and introduce uh, Maggie Chasse. Uh, Maggie is a fifth year graduate student at University of Pennsylvania in Patrick Grohar's lab. And she has um, kind of, she went across the country. She started out in Colorado. She did her Bachelor of Arts in English Literature, which is really cool. I have to ask for some book recommendations um, at Colorado State University. And then she um, did her thesis work or master's thesis work in Dr. Carolyn Luger's lab. So that's super cool. Um, she looked at um, biophysical characterization of part one and part two. So that's uh, great. She's been in the uh, Chromatin field for a little while before starting her PhD work. And owing to that um, great experience, she's also uh, a, a pre she has a pre-doctoral F31 fellowship, which she finished last year. And she's actually on uh, this great fellowship called the K F31. 99K00, which is going to be fantastic when she moves on to her postdoc. Um, so I'm really excited to hear about the work that has been funded by these fellowships and to see what Maggie's been up to. And without more talking, I'm going to let Maggie take the floor. Thank you so much and welcome back, everyone. Thanks, Christine, for that really nice introduction. Let's see if we can go forward. Um, and I apologize if you can hear like a helicopter. I think there's some kind of something happening at the children's hospital here. Um, but like Christine said, my name is Maggie. I am a fifth year graduate student in Patrick Grohar's lab. My home institution is actually at the Van Andel Institute Graduate School, but my boss moved to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia a couple of years ago. And then I'm finishing up this spring to go on to a postdoc in Lenzon's lab at Harvard Medical School. But today, I'm really excited to talk about um, the bulk of my thesis work, which has been identifying a mechanism of action for this compound known as mithromycin, in which we're going to show that it inhibits the switch sniff chromatin remodeling complex, and this induces promoter reprogramming and differentiation in a pediatric malignancy known as rhabdoid tumor. So rhabdoid tumor, like I mentioned, is a pediatric malignancy. Um, it's a very unfortunate disease. It's highly aggressive and very chemo resistant. It's a bit unique in that it can arise in the brain, um, shown by this MRI here, or in the soft tissues, shown in the MRI on the right, or even in the kidney. And all three of these locations are all considered rhabdoid tumor and have the same mutation um, that we're going to talk about in a couple of slides. And because this cancer is very resistant to chemotherapy, the survival is very terrible. Where you can see here, it's only measured in months for median survival if you have a tumor in the brain or you have a 25 to 30 percent four-year progression-free survival if it's in the kidney. And so because of this, um, my boss is an MD-PhD. We're very interested in developing a more effective, targeted, and less toxic therapy. So a few years ago, my boss identified that rhabdoid tumor was sensitive to this compound known as mithromycin. And so what is shown here on the slide is work from the NCI showing the log IC50 of um, the log IC50 of various cancers relative to Ewing sarcoma, which is um, another cancer that we study in the lab. And what you can appreciate here is that all the cancers clustered on the right-hand side of the graph are really sensitive to this compound. And this little purple bar, which is the sixth highest or the sixth most sensitive cancer to mithromycin is um, a cell line from the rhabdoid tumor family. And so we'll go into a bit more about what mithromycin is in a couple of slides. But really the hallmark of the Grohar lab is to improve the translational compounds to the clinic so that patients can actually get better from these diseases. We really need to define a strong mechanism of action and we very much need to link this mechanism to the oncogenic driver or whatever it is the cancer really depends on for proliferation and survival. And so in rhabdoid tumor, identification of the oncogenic driver is fairly easy. It only has a single recurrent mutation, and that is a biallelic deletion or inactivation of SMARC-B1, which is a subunit of the switch SNF chromatin remodeling complex. And we'll go into, again, a bit more detail on how SMARC-B1 loss causes tumorogenesis. But in short, what this does is it causes the loss of um, most of the switch SNF activity in the cell. But what is um, what remains from the switch activity is really required for tumor progression. 
And I always like to point out when talking about switch sniff mutant cancers, um, you can see here in the cartoon on the right that there are a wide variety of cancers that have mutations in this complex. And thanks to efforts from the TCGA and others, it is actually um, one of the most mutated complexes in cancer, comprising for about 20% of all human cancers, including adult and pediatric malignancies. Um, and this little pink subunit here, BAF47, um, is also known as SMRT-B1. So in a normal cell, there are three major families of the switch SNF complex. There's the what we know as canonical switch SNF, which contains the smart b one subunit. And then there are two other families that aren't as talked about quite as much. It's the non-canonical complex, which does not normally contain smart b one And then the poly switch SNF complex, which does contain smart b one and so these families are a little bit different where the non-canonical and the poly occupy promoters, where the non-canonical has um, extra specificity for CTCF binding motifs, whereas the canonical switch SNF predominantly binds enhancers. And so when you lose SMARC-B1 in the case of rhabdoid tumor, there are kind of two working theories for what causes tumorogenesis. The first is that you would have overactivity of a complex known as polycomb repressive complex two, um, a well-known antagonist to switch SNF that would lay down the H3K27 trimethylation mark. And because of this, easy H2 inhibitors are being developed for this disease and currently in clinical trials. However, more recent work from Charlie Roberts' group at St. Jude and Sagal Kadosh at Harvard have shown that there really still is a role for switch SNF in tumorogenesis. So when you lose smart b one you lose the majority of the canonical switch SNF activity because you've lost a subunit that's required. You retain and therefore gain a dependence on this non-canonical switch SNF complex, which never had smart b one to begin with. And similar to the canonical switch SNF, you lose most of the poly switch SNF activity. And so you kind of have two modes of tumorogenesis here. You have one that will block differentiation pathways or apoptotic pathways. And then you have this switch SNF arm, which will increase pro-survival pathways um, and other transcription factors that will be necessary for survival. So because of this, there's this growing thought in the field that perhaps a switch SNF inhibitor may also be beneficial to this disease and a complementary approach to ECH2 inhibitors. And so we really became interested in knowing if mithromycin modulates switch SNF activity. Um, and this was a paper that was just recently accepted at Embo Molecular Medicine. So I'm just going to highlight some of the work here. Um, but if you want more information, definitely read the paper. And so to tackle this, we developed a chromatin fractionation workflow where we are able to take rhabdoid tumor cells that were treated with mithromycin, fractionate them to the nucleus of the cytoplasm, and then we are able to further fractionate the nucleus into a chromatin bound fraction and a nuclear soluble fraction. And so here we are able to kind of track what was happening to switch SNF if it was on chromatin or being trafficked to other parts of the cell following mithromycin treatment. And so what we've shown here, um, doing this fractionation protocol followed by a Western blot, mithromycin does indeed evict SMARC-B1 deficient switch SNF from chromatin. So shown here, focusing on the red box, this is the chromatin fraction, and these are BT12 rhabdoid tumor cells. You can see with our solvent treated, the S column, that we have SMARC-C1, BRD9, and SMARC-E1 all on chromatin, and shown um, to the right are just showing which complexes these subunits belong to to make it a little easier to track. And what you can appreciate is as we increase exposure to 100 nanomolar mithromycin, so this third lane is at 18 hours, we have a decrease of these subunits on chromatin, suggesting that we're evicting these complexes. And we know that it is critical to smart b one deficiency because if we do the similar experiment in U2OS that have smart b one expressed, you can see that the only complex that we are evicting is the non-canonical complex, which doesn't have smart b one to begin with. However, for smart c one you can see we have no change from solvent to treatment because smart b one is present, unlike in rhabdoid tumor where we have a decrease from solvent to treatment due to the lack of SMARC-P1. 
And so we really wanted to tie this to SMARTV1 loss. And so we were gifted doxycycline inducible cells from Charlie Roberts group and where we are able to take rhabdoid tumor cells, add in doxycycline, and then SMARTV1 will be re-expressed. So if this eviction of switch NIF by mithromycin is dependent on the loss of SMARTV1, it should go away once we add doxycycline. And indeed, this is what we found, where on the left, we're showing um, just normal rhabdoid tumor cells. And as we treat with mithromycin, we can see a decrease in BRD9 on chromatin. However, if we reintroduce SMARC-B1 with doxycycline, you can see that we no longer have a reduction of SMARC-E1 and SMARC-B1 on chromatin, but we still retain this BRD9 loss because again, the non-canonical does not have SMARC-B1 present even at baseline. And so this was very exciting to us where we are thinking that mithromycin may actually competitively evict switch SNF or SMARC-B1 deficient switch SNF from chromatin. And so knowing that we are inhibiting the dominant oncogene, we really wanted to understand how does the cell actually respond? And so like I previewed in the introduction, we know that switch SNF and PRC2 are well-known antagonists of one another. So you imagine if we are evicting switch SNF with mithromycin, perhaps PRC2 is then able to come in and trimethylate these areas with H3K27 trimethylation to turn off these pro-tumorigenic target genes. Um, and again, this is what we saw, where if we treat with mithromycin increasing concentrations on this Western blot, you can see that we have a global increase of H3K27 trimethylation in a concentration-dependent manner. Importantly, we are able to recapitulate this in U2OS cells, where if we treat these U2OS cells, which have wild type SMARC-B1 and treat them with mithromycin, we have no effect on H3K27 trimethylation. However, if we use an siRNA to silence SMARC-B1 and therefore genocopy what rhabdoid tumor would normally look like, you can see that we now have a gain in H3K27 trimethylation upon SMARC-B1 loss. So again, this is suggesting to us that these dynamics of switch SNF and PRC2 uh, modulation after mithromycin treatment are dependent on SMARC-B1. And so similar to the fractionation, we really wanted to tie this to the mutation in the tumor. So we use these doxycycline um, inducible cell lines again, where if you have SMARC-B1 lost shown here on the left, you can see that we have that global increase in H3K27 trimethylation upon mithromycin treatment. However, if we reintroduce SMARC-B1 with doxycycline, you can see that that effect goes away. Again, suggesting that this amplification is dependent on SMARC-B1 loss. And finally, to tie this disruption of switch SNF and PRC2 dynamics to the actual sensitivity of mithromycin, we performed dose response curves. Where first on the left, I'm showing rhabdoid tumor cells that have been treated with the EZH2 inhibitor tazemetastat or SIEZH2 in purple. And you can see whether small molecule inhibition or complete loss of the protein shifts this mithromycin dose response curve to the right, showing that these cells are much less sensitive to the compound. However, if we treat U2OS osteosarcoma cell lines, with mithromycin and knock down SMARC-B1, again to genocopy rhabdoid tumor, we now shift these curves to the, um, to the left, showing that these U2OS cells have gained sensitivity to this compound. So all of this data is really consistent with a dependence on SMARC-B1 loss for mithromycin sensitivity. And so finally, we really wanted to understand how does um, loss of SMARC-B1 and loss of the non-canonical switch SNF on chromatin cause and effect genome-wide. Because so far, we've really just kind of looked at Western blots. We haven't looked at actual targets. And so you would imagine if we have evicted this non-canonical switch SNF, we should have a down-regulation of pro-survival genes, and we should have a down-regulation of CTCF targets, as this non-canonical switch SNF occupies CTCF motifs in the promoter. And so to do this, we perform H3K27 acetyl chip sequencing, as well as a dual spiked in attack sequencing, which I'm not talking about today, but happy to answer more questions about later, in which we are able to first show that mithromycin reprograms rhabdoid tumor promoters. So shown here on the left is a donut plot 
And you can see that 75% of the chromatin states in rhabdoid tumor that increase following mithromycin exposure are in the promoter, which would make sense because we know that non-canonical switch NIF primarily occupies promoters as opposed to enhancers. We also showed that we had downregulation or decreased accessibility at known non-canonical switch SNF targets shown here with both the ATT&CK and the H3K27 acetyl chip seek um, at CDKN1A and CDK6. You can see a decrease as we go from the purple to the green. And then finally, our top downregulated attack seek motif was indeed CTCF. And um, again, this was from a novel spike in approach to attack seek, which is a manuscript in preparation. Happy to answer questions about it at the end. But what all of this is suggesting is that what we saw from our Western blot data, we are actually affecting the non canonical switch sniff um, complex. And so, this is the last piece of data that I will show. We really wanted to understand how do these effects translate in vivo. And so while it was great to characterize the mechanism, we really wanted to know, does this mechanism work in a mouse? And therefore, would this mechanism perhaps work in a patient? And so we used a compound known as EC8042. It is an analog of mithromycin. And we've shown that it reduces tumor burden and extends survival in two rhabdoid tumor xenograft models. So on the left, this is a rhabdoid tumor of the kidney xenograft model. And what I'm showing here is a spaghetti plot where the gray bars are our vehicle treated mice and the green bars are our EC8042 treated mice. And this little gray box um, is indicative of a three day continuous infusion of this compound. So these animals only saw three days of drug. And what you can appreciate in both the rhabdoid tumor of the kidney model, as well as this soft tissue sarcoma model on the right, that all of the animals responded. Three out of eight of our animals in the rhabdoid tumor of the kidney had complete cures, where our entire cohort of soft tissue sarcoma um, xenografts had complete cures following just a single three-day infusion. And so this was very exciting to us, um, and we're very hopeful that this would translate to patients. Importantly, we are able to recapitulate our mechanism that we identified in vitro in vivo. Where here, I just mostly wanna highlight that we had this amplification of H3K27 trimethylation following EC8042 exposure. And so we're very hopeful that this staining might lead to a biomarker of target inhibition when we translate this to patients. And then finally, the phenotype is I think the most striking from this entire paper, we are able to show that 8042 induces mesenchymal differentiation with evidence of de novo bone formation. And so shown here, focusing on this three-day pump, um, you can see that as we have exposed these tumors to EC8042, we get the appearance of this dark pink kind of webbed architecture. This is actually trabecular bone formation. And you can see that this dark web of pink kind of expands as the tumor has continued to be exposed to 8042. And this correlated really nicely with an increase in micro CT um, or with micro CT where you can see that we have an increase in ossification or calcification of tumor. Um, so in summary, hopefully I've shown you that Chemical screens are very important to identify new therapeutic compounds. And we've shown that mithromycin targets the switch NIF chromatin remodeling activity by evicting the complex from chromatin. And um, very important for our lab and for these patients, EC8042 may be a promising clinical candidate. Um, and so I have to thank my wonderful lab. Shown here on the left is our nice socially distanced picture from um, as of late. And then on the right, this was the lab before we moved to CHOP. And then um, I also really need to thank Tim Trish and Ben Johnson from Van Andel as they um, are our collaborators on the attack seek portion. And with that, I am happy to take questions. That was a fantastic talk. Thank you, Maggie. Um, so as we start the Q&A session, I just want to remind, I forgot to mention in the beginning, um, two things. One, um, if you're interested in uh, talking with Maggie and Fred um, after the seminar, feel free to stick around for the coffee chat. Just make sure you write in the chat box that you want to attend, and then we will convert you to panelist and you'll be able to stick around. Second, for the Q&A, um, one, you can raise your hand. Two, you can write in the Q&A box what your question is and I'll read it up. 
Um, I had a quick question while we're waiting for questions to um, pile in. Um, that was really interesting with the mithromycin um, kicking off switch sniff from chromatin. Do you think that, if I remember correctly, the SMARC B1 subunit is the one that interacts with the nucleosomacidic patch based on the cryo-EM structures? Mm -hmm. and, um, I think Seagal's lab also did some uh, in vivo work with that. Do you think that uh, the mithrom, like, I'm just wondering how, like, do you have any insights on like what the mithromycin itself could be doing to like, is it destabilizing it because there's like not the extra facet yeah. that interacts with the nucleosome or? You're right on. So I didn't have time to mention because there's so much biology behind this, but um, when you lose SMARC B1, you're, as you mentioned, you lose a very important interaction with the nucleosome. So you destabilize this complex on chromatin and it has a lower affinity. And so we think that is why mithromycin is able to evict those complexes relative if SMARC-B1 is present. We don't know if mithromycin is binding at the DNA surface or the histone surface, but we do know that the chromatin mm -hmm. contact is critical because we have non-DNA binding analogs that show no activity. Oh, interesting. Cool. That's, yeah, it seems like really promising in the um, tumor result, um, even to my basic science trained <laughs> eye, was seemed to be very striking. So it's really cool. Um, okay, so let's see if we have, um, okay, so first we have um, Craig Peterson. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. And trainees, feel free to ask questions too. Um, but first I'm going to uh, unmute. There we go. Okay, so you should be able to talk now. Very good. Thank you, Maggie. Great chat, great, great talk today. Really exciting stuff. Um, so a couple questions about cause and effect on the mithromycin story. So one, do you, have you guys looked in vitro to see is it is mithromycin sufficient in vitro to basically disrupt switch sniff from chromatin either plus or minus spark B1? Um, I guess in related to that, how can you rule out indirect effects? How do you know it's not polycomb that's being somehow activated that's actually kicking off the switch rather than the compound acting directly on the switch? Fantastic questions. Um, and so to get at your first question right. Now we're actually doing mass spectrometry with Matt Weitzman and Ben Garcia here at Penn. So we can see what is bound at a much um, more specific level on chromatin following mithromycin treatment. And so, so far we've only done the Western blot showing that you lose it globally, but we're hoping that the mass spec will be much more sensitive and we'll be able to show kinetics a bit more clearly of what's getting kicked off when as well as what is coming on when. So that might also be able to kind of parse out, is it switch sniff getting kicked off and then PRC2 coming on or is PRC2 coming thereby kicking it off? Right, so I guess the question is why, why would it be specific to switch sniff? So, I mean, presumably if you look at the cryo structure, the only thing that's really holding the switch onto a nuke without the sniff five home log is the ATPA subunit, right? So I would you know, think that this would also eliminate I switch complexes or chuds or other things that engage very similarly. As so if it is acting directly on switch, I'm wondering more if it's involved in disrupting recruitment pathways rather than actually stripping it off chromatin. Totally, totally true. And so we don't know. That's again why we wanted to do the mass spec so we could just get a global view to see like, are we affecting other chromatin remodelers? Are we affecting histone demethylases, et cetera? Um, in, which is very possible because mithromycin, um, I know that you've done some work on chromomycin, but it's a natural product. So it's going to bind lots of places in the genome. And we think we mostly focused on switch sniff here because that was the dominant gene in this tumor. So it made, or the dominant oncogene. So it made the most sense to start there, but that's not to say that it doesn't have effect on any of the other epigenetic complexes. We just don't know yet. Oh, fabulous. If you ever want anyone to basically look at a host of remodeling enzymes in vitro, we're happy to, to help out with you guys. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. <laughs> we have them all. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Maggie. Great chat. Thank you. Cool. So I'm going to ask one question from Natalia. Um, and then, uh, like I said, if you're interested in staying after um, to ask more questions or just, you know, tell Maggie what a great job she did, um, <laughs> uh, feel free to stick around. But um, so Natalia is asking, um, uh, do the, she said, great talk. You mentioned that a subset of switch sniffs interact with promoters and a subset with enhancers. How about active enhancers, which contact promoters? Yes. 
Um, and so this is something, again, we haven't done. And I'm actually fairly surprised in rhabdoid tumor as a whole, chromatin confirmation has not really been explored. And so the short answer is yes, we haven't looked at that yet, but I think looping um, and looking at different compartments following mithromycin treatment is definitely something we're interested in. Cool, great. So um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and switch over to Hanukkah and she will introduce uh, Fred Winston. Thank you, Maggie.